In this video lecture, our penultimate lecture, we talk about Kant's transcendental idealism and representationalism. Kant's theory is admittedly a bit hard to get your head around at first, but it does offer us a more nuanced version of representationalism, one that eventually becomes the model for many present-day representationalist theories of perception. In the last video, we covered the basics of Kant's transcendental theory of imagination and perception. I need to emphasize again that what I've given you is like the Coles Notes version of Kant's theory. That means that I'm giving you the conclusions of his arguments and skipping over his detailed and careful proofs in defense of those conclusions. Last year when I taught this, one student accused Kant of just stating that time and space are a priori intuitions without ever proving it. But I need to emphasize that that is very much not the case. He spends pages and pages defending all of the claims that we're talking about. It's just that we don't have time in this course to get into it. As I mentioned last time, there is a third year course at U of T that is devoted exclusively to the critique and I highly recommend taking it. There you'll see how and why Kant comes to the conclusions that he does and how he backs them up with extensive proofs. So having said that, we can jump straight to the crux of Kant's conclusion for how it is that he thinks our thoughts about objects are connected to our sensory experiences of them. He argues that the imagination is what does this not at an a posteriori level, as Hume had it, but at an a priori one. That means that Kant sees the imagination as playing a necessary role in perception because it is what makes experience possible in the first place. Kant argues that the imagination's a priori role is productive, meaning that the imagination is synthesizing information as it is coming in, such that our experience of objects is already complex as soon as it, as it is taken up by the mind. That means that the imagination is hard at work before sensation. It's what makes sensory experience immediately understandable to us. This is the visual I showed you last time to illustrate how and where Kant sees the imagination coming into play twice in our sensory experiences. The productive imagination comes into play here, before sensory experience of objects. The imagination is what synthesizes our thoughts together. It's what first holds our various thoughts together as being united in one single consciousness. That is how we recognize at an a priori level that all our experiences are happening to us as one single experiencer. And the productive imagination also synthesizes our two main a priori levels of cognition ahead of possible experience. To explain that, last time I used the metaphorical example of the computer and its operating system. We can understand this pre-experience level of cognition as rules that tell our brains how to take in sense data and how to conceptualize it. This is not unlike a computer's programming or coding that has to be in place before the computer is able to accept and make use of data. As I said last time, Kant argues that there are effectively two main kinds of coding compartments, if you will, that our brains need in order to have experiences and make sense of them. On the one side is what Kant calls sensibility or intuition. He argues, after long careful proofs, that we have two fundamental rules for how we can experience objects. They have to be in 3D space, and they have to be temporal. These are not in the objects per se. They're rather the way that we experience, or the way that we are capable of taking in data about things. A metaphorical way to help this make sense conceptually is to think of it in terms of compatibility. The data doesn't itself have to be 4D, but it does have to be compatible with our operating system, such that our brain's coding can interpret it in that way. 
So, for example, what if the universe itself is one-dimensional and not temporal, such that the whole of what we call time happens in one single instant? Our brains would have to convert that data into a 4D format in order to take it in as experience. We're not programmed to experience time as a single instant, or to experience space as one-dimensional. And if the data, or a large portion of the data, simply isn't convertible to match our operating system's 4D requirement, then we'd not be able to take in that part, the part of the universe that isn't compatible to a 4D format is, or would be, simply non-existent as far as our brain and our experience is concerned. So that is the sensibility side. The other side is the understanding or conceptual side. There we also have rules, or, in our computer metaphor, coding. Our brain can only conceptualize thought propositionally. There are 12 overarching basic, basic level compartments, what Kant calls the categories, into which all our concepts fall. The categories can be understood as conceptual rules that we apply to experience that, in a way that allows us to recognize and think about data that we take in from the world. These rules are universal in the sense that all of us have the same rules that we must apply to experience. This means that you, me, everyone takes in data in the same way at this very basic programming level. We can, of course, have differences of opinion or make mistakes, but what Kant means is that our brains are such that we necessarily identify things as being causally connected, or as substance, or as having quantity. He's talking about that kind of super fundamental level of recognizing objects and experience. And this is where the productive imagination comes in. The imagination's job is to synthesize information. The, inf the imagination is able to connect up the a priori intuitions of space and time to the a priori concepts. And this has to be in place in order for us to have any kind of experience at all. Metaphorically, the imagination is the computer process that allows the different compartments of coding to speak to each other and operate together. Here's the visual I used last time to demonstrate how the productive imagination is synthesizing sensibility with understanding, meaning how it is taking in objects as spatiotemporal on the one hand, and at the same time understanding them as conforming to the pure concepts, meaning the categories. This is how Kant thinks we recognize immediately that something is universal, that it exists, that it is causally connected and necessary. It's not that those concepts literally exist in the objects themselves. It's that that is the way that we necessarily take in the information about the object at a fundamental programming level. And this is why Kant thinks that we, can t that we take in ideas as already complex. Remember that Locke and Hume thought that we take in sense data as simple ideas that the mind then combines into complex ideas, but not Kant. Kant says that the synthesizing productive role of the imagination means that objects are already complex as soon as we take them in. This was the visual I used to illustrate this. It's because we have to experience objects as spatiotemporal and have to conceptualize them according to the categories that we never experience a 3D object as flat, meaning as having just one dimension, nor as being a collection of various simple ideas like color, shape, smell, without experiencing them together in a single cohesive object. The productive imagination synthesizes the external data according to our internal programming rules, such that we take information in in the first place as conforming to our coding requirements. So that was the a priori productive side of imagination. But Kant also thinks that the imagination has an a posteriori 
reproductive role into play in perception as well. That's when the imagination comes into play here in this visual, in between sensory experience and our more conscious thought about objects. Now, this visual is a bit imperfect in that, as I keep emphasizing, our sensory experience comes in already complex on Kant's scheme. Maybe this would be a more accurate way to illustrate Kant's a posteriori level conception of perception. So sensory experience necessarily already includes 4D objects that conform to the concepts at a fundamental programming level. But Kant thinks the imagination has to come in again at a reproductive level in order for us to be able to recognize objects as being like others we've seen before or as being connected to each other. In other words, the imagination has to play a second synthesizing role at the after-experience level in order for us to recognize those objects and think about them consciously. Here's Kant again. We saw this excerpt from the Critique of Pure Reason last time. He writes, it is, however, clear that even this apprehension of the manifold alone would bring forth no image and no connection of the impressions were there not a subjective ground for calling back a perception from which the mind has passed on to another, to the succeeding ones, and thus for exhibiting entire series of perceptions, i.e., a reproductive faculty of imagination, which is then also merely empirical. It is the reproductive role of the imagination that allows us to mentally recreate objects in our minds as mental representations. We've seen that the image of the house is already taken in as 4D and as a substance that exists and so on. But it is the reproductive role of the imagination that allows you to recognize that this particular 4D object is a house, and also to be able to imagine what the unseen parts of it might look like. The reproductive imagination is still performing an unconscious synthesizing role here at the a posteriori level. What the a posteriori imagination is doing is matching your experiences to what Kant calls a schemata that comes from past experience. This is still, though, involving a priori functions. Remember that one of the categories was commonality, or at least in my paraphrased translation of Kant's own technical terms, that is. This matching work is still a necessary part of how our brains are programmed to take in information. But as for the specific things that this tree is common to, that, of course, can only come from past experience. That's why I've added this plus point here in our list. Past experience is not one of the categories, but it is nonetheless a critical component in our ability to make sense of anything. What the reproductive imagination does is apply those categories to information it has gotten from experience. The brain is, again metaphorically, programmed to categorize our experiences according to what Kant calls schemata, that is, a class of objects that are related to each other. And so we can take in the information about this tree and catalog it. It shares commonality with tree-like things, with green things, and with plants. But it doesn't share commonality with flowers, and so the mind can reject it as falling in that particular schematic box. And this allows us to make sense of our mental representations according to commonality. So it isn't some weird fiction of our minds that has us thinking about things in terms of classifications, like this is either animal, plant, or mineral, or is this deciduous or coniferous. That, that's part of the way our brains are programmed to make sense of stuff. In order to do that, though, we need the reproductive part of the imagination, with the help of memory, to allow us to compare our mental representations and recognize commonalities and relations between things. And this is what allows us to understand this tree, for example, as being not only a tree, but also green and also non-deciduous. 
This process is synthetic, meaning that it is combining a priori processes, the a priori intuitions of space and time plus the concepts, with a posteriori processes that compare information that we get from past experience. So even though Kant is saying the imagination comes in twice, shouldn't properly be speaking be thought of as chronologically coming in once and then again afterwards. This is all happening at the same time. It's just that one function is happening at a deep programming level, meaning at an a priori level, and one is happening at a more conscious or almost conscious a posteriori level. So at a certain level, both the a priori and a posteriori work is happening instantly. And then, of course, the imagination can continue to do its work at a less instant level, finding all sorts of other forms and associations to apply to the experience, as well as to do what we normally think of the imagination as, as doing. We can then imagine the tree being purple, or as containing a tiny dragon. All that comes in at the reproductive level that takes up and combines mental representations in ways not unlike what Locke and Hume saw the imagination doing. This is another citation that we saw last time. Here's Kant saying that the empiricists like Locke and Hume, because they neglect the a priori role of the imagination, are a not able to explain how we are aware of things that we can't experience, like causality and substance, but also b, assigning to sensation a synthesizing role that Kant argues needs more than just representations of objects drawn from experience. He writes, No psychologist, i.e. empiricist like Locke or Hume, has yet thought that the imagination is a necessary ingredient of perception itself. This is so partly because this faculty has been limited to reproduction, and partly because it has been believed that the senses do not merely afford us impressions, but also put them together, and produce images of objects, for which, without doubt, something more than the receptivity of impressions is required, namely, a function of synthesis of them. In other words, he doesn't deny that the imagination does this reproductive work, but he argues that the imagination has to do more than just put representations together. There has to be something more involved in order to explain how and why it is that our brains seem designed to recognize not only things like causality, but also that the objects of experience can be categorized into all these conceptual boxes. All of that, Kant argues, is a function of the synthesizing a priori functions with a posteriori information. So to reiterate, on Kant's scheme, the imagination is a connector between sensation and thought. It does this specifically because he thinks the imagination is the faculty that is responsible for synthesis at both an a priori and an a posteriori level. Now, all of that information about the imagination is at play beneath the surface in Kant's representationalism. We'll see that he doesn't bring up the imagination specifically in the following explanation and defense of representationalism. But we, so we just have to keep in mind that representations are only possible if the imagination is doing this a, pro, a priori and a posteriori work. The imagination is the faculty responsible for giving us mental representations in the first place. And, as we'll see in the remainder of this lecture, representationalism is at the heart of Kant's theory of perception. But as we'll also see, his version of representationalism is quite different from Locke's and Hume's. The rest of this lecture uses Kant's prolegomena for any future metaphysics. You've perhaps read this book already if you've taken Phil 210. I'm going to be drawing out specifically the things that Kant says in here that relate to his representationalism. One thing to note is that this little book should be understood as being a summary of the critique of pure reason. Kant wrote it effectively as an instructor's guide to the critique. 
In it, he in particular focuses on the things his critics didn't like or didn't understand about his larger work. And that is why it is particularly useful for us. His detractors and interpreters were especially confused about the implications of Kant's talk about appearances and things in themselves, meaning about his representationalism. He was accused of being an idealist like Berkeley, and, as we'll note near the end, he takes a special pains to try to make clear that he sees himself as much more in line with Locke and Hume than he does with Berkeley and even with Descartes. To make sense of Kant's representationalism, we need to note that Kant's goal is to show a necessary connection between our experiences, i.e. our perceptions, and the objects that cause them. Remember that this is what Hume said couldn't be done, and is why Hume embraced skepticism about both the senses and reason alike. Kant's argument is that we can explain things like our conception of causation and necessity even if we can't experience these in nature. Kant also argues that we really can know about universal laws of nature and that these are not fictions or inductive leaps that are invented by the imagination, as Hume argued. But Kant's argument about this comes with one huge caveat. Kant demonstrates that our experience of causality, identity slash substance, and necessity is necessarily and objectively connected to the objects of experience, which is the thing that Hume doubted. So Kant rejects Hume's doubt about causality and substance slash identity by saying that, yes, our knowledge of these universals is true and objective and solid. But here's the caveat. The necessary connection between object and perception of objects, meaning our mental representations of objects, applies only to appearances. In other words, Kant agrees with Hume's talk of a double existence of objects, which is what, by the way, a direct realist would deny. Kant is a representationalist and does think that there are two things, in a sense, in every object. On the one hand, there is the object itself, as it is, beyond and without us. He calls that the thing in itself, or the noumena. And on the other, there is the object of possible experience, meaning the object as it is for us, who are experiencing it as an object of perception. He calls the object that we experience phenomena. That means that everything in the world, for us that is, has both a noumenal and a phenomenal level. But we can only ever experience the phenomenal level. We can perhaps theorize about the noumena, but effectively, no matter what we say about noumena, we are kind of just making stuff up because we are talking about something we cannot possibly experience, no matter what. We can only experience phenomena. And so we can only claim knowledge about phenomena, meaning the level of things that we can possibly experience. What is phenomena? And why is it only that that we can experience? Remember what I've been drilling into you about the a priori intuitions of space and time. We can only experience things in space and time and as conforming to the pure concepts of the understanding. If they are outside of that, if they are non-temporal and, say, one-dimension or one-dimensional or ten-dimensional, if they don't fit into our programming rules about how to categorize data, then it's, not, it's just not possible for us to experience them. But it isn't that four-dimensionality and the categories exist in the objects. It's that those things are in us as the programming level code that we necessarily, each and every one of us, apply to any and all data that we take in about the world. Here's Kant explaining this. 
we must assume that everything which can be given to our senses, to the external senses in space and to the internal sense in time, is intuited by us as it appears to us, not as it is in itself. Pure mathematics and especially pure geometry can only have objective reality on condition that it refers merely to objects of sense. But in regard to the latter, the principle holds good that our sense representation is not a representation of things in themselves, but of the way in which they appear to us. Meaning that Kant is specifying that he is always talking about the objects as they appear to us and not as they are in themselves outside of us. Meaning outside of the possible realm of our ability to experience them. That means that Kant's theory of perception applies only to how objects appear to us as mental representations. They may seem at one level pretty obvious, or sorry, that may seem at one level pretty obvious and mundane in the sense that a statement like perception includes only information that is possible to perceive doesn't sound that important on first hearing, maybe. But as we'll see, this mantra that we only experience appearances and not the things themselves, is what allows him to conclude that Hume is wrong about the origins of our ideas about causality and universal laws of nature. Here's Kant. For sensuous perception represents things not at all as they are, but only the mode in which they affect our senses, and consequently by sensuous perception appearances only and not things themselves, are given to the understanding for reflection. Despite his insistence that we only know appearances, or more precisely, because of it, he claims that we can know about universals and objectively valid truths about objects and how they interact and behave. How does this rule about appearances get him to how we can know about universal truths and necessary causal connections? It's because the objects of experience necessarily conform to certain universal rules in order for them to be experienced by us in the first place. This brings us back to our computer metaphor. When we experience an object, we necessarily experience it in the context of our formatting, meaning that our brains always interpret the data from the world according to a priori coding or programming rules that applies to all human and potentially all earthly sentient creature brains. This formatting is universally shared, so it means that we are all processing the data in the same fundamental way, i.e. basic programming level. Meaning that we all take in information about the world spatiotemporally and as conforming to basic conceptual rules about quantity, substance, identity, causality, and so on. That's because, metaphorically, we all share the same basic operating system, one designed for four-dimensionality and, for humans, propositional thought. Meaning that we synthesize information from the world of experience according to the same a priori rules. And this is why we can recognize universally applicable laws of nature. It's because they are universally valid for us according to the rules of our shared operating system. Here's Kant, but first, note that when Kant says subjective, he means it in a very specific way. Subjective for Kant means the way we humans take in information. So it's subjective in the sense that it is us, our brains, that read the information in a particular way but it's not subjective in the sense that it is often used as meaning that it depends just on the individual. It's more like collectively subjective, because each and every human brain will share the interpretation. So here's Kant explaining our understanding of universal laws of nature. He writes, 
We cannot therefore study the nature of things a priori other otherwise than by investigating the conditions and the universal, though subjective, laws under which alone such a cognition as experience, as to mere form, is possible. And we determine accordingly the possibility of things as objects of experience. We talked about this already. Our brain's a priori functions synthesize a posteriori information according to a priori rules. And that means that the way we experience things has a universal universality about it. If we are experiencing it, it means that it is conforming to our brain's processing system. And that processing, processing system follows rules. It has to be spatiotemporal. It has to fit into the categories. The brain will sort the information according to whether the experience or thing is conforming to a universal or a particular, to a necessary connection or an accidental one, and so on. That means that each and every one of us will universally experience certain things like temporality and causality in the same way. Again, this isn't to suggest that we can't make mistakes, but it does mean that our brains are designed to recognize whether, for example, it is a universal truth that all the angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees, or whether it is an accidental or particular thing. Our brains are designed to recognize that objects moving in 3D space and one-dimensional time always have the effect uh, the effect comes after a cause and will accelerate at a predictable rate. Our fundamental programming is such that this is necessarily how information is taken in, and in that sense, it is a universal law that every effect must be preceded by a cause, or that velocity is equal to distance divided by time. Even though Kant is just talking about appearances, these appearances are not disconnected from the objects. However, they are not technically speaking in the object either. It's us who experience the world as being in space and time, but that isn't because we invent it. It's because that's the way the data coming from the objects is registered by our brains. It's how we are designed, not, I should mention, in the sense necessarily of being literally designed by some god, but designed, perhaps, in an evolutionary kind of way. It's how our brains are made to experience our world. So, in that sense, it is us who think about spatiotemporal objects in terms of causality and identity, because that is how our brains synthesize information. Kant argues that these are the a priori and universal conditions of possible experience. Which means that we necessarily experience the universe as conforming to predictable laws of nature. Kant's a priori structure allows him to explain to us why it is that we can know about things that are outside of our experience provided, that is, that they are at a minimum conceptualizable in a four-dimensional space-time. How do we know about quarks and dark matter, or about black holes and the curvature of space, or of things like infinity and necessity? We know about them because we are able to apply our pure intuitions about space and time and our pure concepts about universality and necessity to logically deduce that they are there. We can then continue to use mathematics and observation to substantiate or refute those logical deductions. But on a human account, for example, it becomes very hard to explain how, for example, Einstein or Stephen Hawking could have possibly been able to use mathematics and theoretical physics to determine that black holes exist and behave in specific predictable ways ahead of any a posteriori experience of them. Here's Kant again. 
Accordingly, we shall here be concerned merely with experience and with the universal conditions of its possibility, which are given a priori. Thence we shall determine nature as the whole object of a whole of, of, of all possible experience. I think it will be understood that I here do not mean the rules of the observation of a nature that is already given, for these already presuppose experience. I do not mean how, through experience, we can study the laws of nature, for these would not then be laws a priori, and would yield, no, yield us no pure natural science. But I mean to ask how the conditions a priori of the possibility of experience are at the same time the sources from which all the universal laws of nature must be derived. Kant argues that our a priori structure is such that information about the world must be processed in universally valid ways for us. When we observe laws of nature, we can determine that they are universally applicable. And they really are universal rules. They are rules that our minds apply to the conditions of experience. And this is how Newton is able to draw up laws of physics. It's not based on probability or induction, says Kant. These are universal laws about how the objects of our possible experience must behave not according to our past experiences, as Hume had it, but according to the necessary laws for how our brains process that experience. And this is what gives them objective validity. It is the way that we necessarily take in that kind of information from the universe. It is the universally shared, between us humans that is, application of this synthesis of a priori intuitions and a priori concepts. This is what Kant says. He writes, As this is the case with all objects of sense, judgments of experience take their objective validity not from the immediate cognition of the object, which is impossible, impossible for the same reason Hume identified. It's impossible to experience universality and necessity a posteriori. That, by the way, was my added note, not from Kant. But merely from the condition of universal validity of empirical judgments, which, as already said, never rests upon empirical, or in short, sensuous conditions, but upon pure concept of the understanding. In other words, Kant openly agrees with Hume that laws of nature and causality are not possible to experience. He says that Hume is right, that if it was the case that all we had was a posteriori experience, we'd not be able to talk about universal laws of nature as genuine knowledge. In that case, we really wouldn't be able to apply the concept of universality to nature in a true sense. All we'd be able to say is that based on past experience, this is what we have known to date. But Kant's argument is that it is the fact that our brains are processing information according to a priori rules, meaning that we do not just have a posteriori experience, that allows us to have universally shared experiences of necessity. Here's Kant. This complete, though to its originator unexpected, solution of Hume's problem rescues for the pure concepts of the understanding their a priori origin, and for the universal laws of nature their validity as laws of the understanding, yet in such a way as to limit their use to experience. Because their possibility depends solely on the reference of the understanding to experience, but with a completely reversed mode of connection, which never occurred to Hume, they are not derived from experience, but experience is derived from them. And that is why Kant says that laws of nature are not derived from experience. They are not even possible to derive from experience. But the fact that we recognize these laws of physics as being universal, as being applicable to realms like 
deep space and is applying to things that we've never experienced, like wormholes and black holes, or hadn't experienced at the time they were theorized. It's that that can't be, uh, that for those reasons that it can't be the case that all our knowledge is derived solely from experience. Rather, our experience is derived from our a priori universal rules of understanding. Our minds are able to extrapolate out from our internal knowledge of space and time to understand how objects in space and time operate. This explains how we can apply our laws of physics to tell us about things that we haven't yet experienced, things of astrophysics like black holes and wormholes. But what Kant's representationalism means is that universality and laws of nature and physics apply to the way that we experience them. And these laws do not necessarily apply to the things themselves. They apply specifically to how objects in 4D space behave for us, with the kind of brain that we have. Kant writes, Consequently, I do not say that things in themselves possess a quantity, that their reality possesses a degree, their existence a connection of accidents in a substance, etc. Nobody can prove this. This takes place because appearances, as mere intuitions occupying a part of space and time, come under the concept of quantity which synthetically unites their multiplicity a priori according to rules. But Kant thinks this nonetheless counts as certainty about objects and their behavior. These are not mere fictions. We can be certain that, provided we are talking about the objects that are possible for us to experience, these laws do and will apply. As far as objects are experienceable by us, then we can know or figure out with thought and logic how they behave in space and time. Kant argues that this, then, solves Hume's skeptical doubt. He writes, Now we are prepared to remove Hume's doubt. He justly maintains that we cannot comprehend by reason the possibility of causality, that is, of the reference of the existence of one thing to the existence of another, which is necessitated by the former. I add that we comprehend just as little the concept of subsistence, that is, the necessity that at the foundation of the existence of things there lies a subject which cannot itself be a predicate of any other thing. Nay, we cannot even form a concept of the possibility of such a thing, though we can point out examples of its use and experience. But I am very far from holding these concepts to be derived merely from experience and the necessity represented in them to be fictitious and a mere illusion produced in us by long habit. On the contrary, I have amply shown that they and the principles derived from them are firmly established a priori before all experience and have their undoubted objective rightness, though only in regard to experience. But here's the question that philosophers of his own day asked Kant. If Kant is telling us that all our experience and knowledge applies only to our mental representations of them, of their appearances only, and not how they are in themselves, does that make Kant an idealist, like Berkeley? Or does it make him a skeptic, like Descartes? Is Kant telling us that all we can be certain about is what is in our own minds? Kant insists that the answer to both these questions is emphatically no. Here he is explaining why he is neither an idealist nor a skeptic. He writes, Idealism consists in the assertion that there are none but thinking beings. All other things which we believe are perceived in intuitions uh, are nothing but representations in the thing thinking beings to which no object external to them in fact corresponds. On the contrary, I say that things as objects of our senses existing outside us are given, 
but we know nothing of what they may be in themselves, knowing only their appearances, i.e. the representations which they cause in us by affecting our senses. Consequently, I grant by all means that there are bodies without us, that is, things which, though quite unknown to us as to what they are in themselves, yet we yet know by the representations which they, their influence on our sensibility procures in us, and which we call bodies. This word, bodies, merely means the appearance of the thing which is unknown to us, but is not therefore less real. Can this be termed idealism? It is the very contrary. In fact, Kant argues that his ideas are just following from Locke, but in a way that's more coherent, he thinks. Like all the philosophers we've studied in this course, Kant recognizes that our knowledge of things is reliant on our ability to experience them. There's no guarantee that our brains and physical organs are giving us a 100% accurate picture of the world as it really is. In fact, the science coming out of the scientific revolution was clear about this. It's something we still know from science. Our sense organs and our brains interpret information about the universe in ways that are not giving us the full picture. In today's understanding, for example, we know that we don't experience quarks, or dark matter, or particles moving in waves. Not directly, anyway. Our experience is one thing, and the universe itself is another. The objects of experience conform to our brains, in how we experience them, not how they are in themselves. Kant argues that this is not terribly unlike the representationalist ideas that were common to philosophers of his time, philosophers that we've studied in this course. He writes, Long before Locke's time, but surely since him, it has been generally assumed and granted without detriment to the actual existence of external things that many of their predicates may be said to belong not to the things themselves, but to their appearances and to have no proper existence outside our representation. Heat, color, and taste, for instance, are of this kind. Now, if I go further, and for weighty reasons, rank as mere appearances also the remaining qualities of bodies, which are called primary, such as extension, place, and, in general, space, with all that which belongs to it, no one in the least can adduce the reason of its being inadmissible. As little as the man who admits color not to be the properties of the object in itself, but only to be modifications of the sense of sight, should on that account be called an idealist, so little can my doctrine be named idealistic, merely because I find that more, nay, all the properties which constitute the intuition of a body belong merely to its appearance. In other words, as we've seen already in other critiques of Locke's primary-secondary quality distinction, Kant is saying, like Berkeley and Hume did, that all the reasons why Locke says that secondary qualities like color and heat are not in the object equally apply to the primary qualities. Kant is saying that he is in agreement here, he is noting, like Locke and Hume, that these sensory representations of objects are in us, not in the objects themselves. But he nonetheless insists that this, very dif that this is very different than the idealist conception that denies the existence of external objects. He doesn't deny that they are there. He just denies that we can know about them beyond the ways that we can experience them. He says, the existence of the thing that appears is thereby not destroyed, as in genuine idealism, but it is only shown that we cannot possibly know it by the senses as it is in itself. So we can definitely see that Kant is not a direct realist. He doesn't claim that our senses directly put us in touch with the objects in a passive way. But he isn't, properly speaking, an indirect realist either. 
He shares with the indirect realists like Locke and Hume that he thinks that what we know of the world is our mental representations of the objects as they perceptually appear to us. But he doesn't see those mental representations as being copies of impressions or as ideas that sit between the mind and the objects themselves. Instead, Kant's representationalism is interactive. It involves a synthesizing process between the mind and the objects. Because he argues that the objects of sensation must conform to our a priori rules, or operating system as I've been calling it, it means that we experience the objects directly in a sense, directly because we engage with the objects at a systematic level that in effect converts the raw sense data as it is coming in into a format that our minds can make sense of, meaning that it is understood and taken up as 4D and as conformable to the categories. And as such, they conform to our universal rules about how objects are and how they behave. And so the mental representations, then, are not like a veil at all. They're more like a means or a set of a priori rules that allow for experiencing objects. The sensory information is synthesized in a rules-based way, in a kind of instantaneous and active way. Kant calls this spontaneity. It's meant to convey that the process of taking in information as mental representations is active and happens at both an a priori and an a posteriori level. And this is what gives us access to objects as appearances, as the way they necessarily appear to us, that is, as spatiotemporal and as conformable to reason and thought. This is now the more common way that present-day philosophers conceptualize representationalist theories of perception. They use the words content-bearing to describe a way of taking in sense data as already conformable to thought. Effectively, it means that, unlike the direct realists who argue that our senses passively and directly take in more or less accurate information about the world, and also, unlike the direct realists like Locke and Hume, who argue that the mind takes up sensory information first and then combines it and reflects on that information, Kant, and also many modern-day representationalists, see sensory information as coming in as already available to thought, because that is how the mind has to receive the data. So sensory information isn't taken in first and thought about after. The process is more spontaneous, more interactive than that. And it isn't uncommon to find present-day philosophers who endorse this kind of view. John McDowell, for example, in his incredibly important and notoriously difficult book called Mind and World from the mid-1990s, made the following case in favor of Kant's theory of perception. He writes, under concepts and intuitions, one, the overall topic I am going to consider in these lectures is the way concepts mediate the relation between minds and the world. I shall focus the discussion in terms of a familiar philosophical outlook, which Donald Davidson has described as a dualism of scheme and content. That will get us quickly to Kant. One of my main aims is to, is to suggest that Kant should still have a central place in our discussion of the way thought bears on reality. In other words, the contribution Kant is often credited, credited with bringing to theories of perception is in giving thought, i.e. concepts, an active role in how we take in sense data in the first place. And as we learned last time and at the beginning of this lecture, you can't divorce Kant's theory of perception that synthesizes what McDowell calls mind and world from the imagination. Kant argues that that synthesizing work is the imagination's job, and that perception cannot happen in the first place without it. 
It is the imagination that makes it possible for us to take in information as already contentful. It does this by synthesizing the pure intuitions with the pure concepts at an a priori level and thus allows us to take in information as already synthesized and already complex. This is admittedly a difficult theory to get one's head around, but it nevertheless does have many important benefits. For example, it avoids a view of perception that requires the mind to take in sense data first and only then convert it into ideas. This is perhaps what Hume was struggling to explain with impressions and ideas, and is perhaps why present-day philosophers find it so hard to make sense of what he means. And it also explains how we have knowledge of things that are not available to experience, something both Locke and Hume struggled to do. And yet, it also avoids the very speculative kind of empirical idealism that Berkeley endorses, where we have to sacrifice the existence of physical reality in order to explain perception. But admittedly, Kant's scheme is nonetheless a kind of idealism. He calls it transcendental idealism. It requires us to forego knowledge of noumena, of things in themselves, and requires that when it comes to knowledge and perception, we have to limit ourselves to talking only about the appearances of things to us, and not of things as they are beyond our capacity to experience them. But perhaps that's not such a crazy proposition. Many scientists and astrophysicists propose that the universe is perhaps far more complicated than our experience of it suggests. In that vein, I have posted a, an, a, another optional PBS video for you to check out if you're interested. This is a program that I quite like. It's called Space Time. The video I'm recommending asks whether the universe is actually one-dimensional. Now, Kant would say that we can't know anything about that kind of thing, apart from just talking about it in very vague theoretical terms. But the video is neat as a complement to Kant's point that four-dimensionality is something that we experience of the universe that isn't necessarily true of the universe itself. So that was our last lecture covering a specific philosopher. The next and last video will be a shorter one designed specifically to review the theme of representationalism versus direct realism that appeared in every philosopher that we've studied. That video will be particularly helpful for your preparation for your final test, now due by midnight on Monday, June 22nd. So that was our last video on Kant. Thank you everyone for listening, and I'll talk to you again shortly. The next video will be posted on or before Monday the 15th. Thanks everybody for listening. Talk to you next time.